Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome to another K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. By the way, K-Cups come in three sizes, single, double, and triple shots, or roughly one minute, five minutes, or ten minutes in length. So if you don't have time to throw back an entire caffeinated career conversation, these K-Cup mini episodes of T4C can give you a quick caffeinated fix, whether you're on the go or you only have a few minutes to binge. So grab your mug and take a chug, because it's time for a caffeinated career triple shot K-Cup with my guest, Josh Lebs. I also think it's important to mention because I do think it's great within higher ed as a student because you can study whatever interests you. But the downside is that you end up becoming intellectually siloed and you tend to think of yourself as whatever. The comp lit major, my only options lie in teaching, in becoming a book editor, you tend to think very linearly. And I think one of the wonderful things that people discover is that you can be an entrepreneur in pretty much any industry. You can have an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think we heard Josh talking about the entrepreneurial mindset he had at NPR, whether it was innovating a will follow a Hurricane Katrina survivor over a period of a couple of years, or I'll, and he's going to talk about it now, innovate a new beat at CNN. Yeah. You don't just have to be an entrepreneur in terms of running your own business. You can be in the driver's seat in an entrepreneurial way of your own professional journey. So interesting that you say that. I mean, now that you have me pause and think this through, there is a direct line between I have an idea for a children's musical, now it exists, to I'm going to show up in Atlanta and create a career, to I'm going to show up at the public radio station and make something happen, to I'm going to create this business. And as for everyone listening, you know, yeah, this is so important that you not silo yourself through your major. And one way to avoid doing that is to think of what you have to offer the entire world as a big collection of skills. And the skills that you have will most likely apply to any field. So as long as you recognize that you have skills and will keep building skills, you don't need to limit yourself at all to specific professions. A hundred percent. It's called transferable skills. And you will have them from the time you are in school throughout your professional journey. Don't allow yourself to be siloed in an industry or a company if you feel the itch to grow. Follow your instinct and your gut. So I know, Josh, you never applied to work at NPR or at CNN. So how did you get your foot in the door at CNN? When you and I first met, you were working at Wire CNN Mm -hmm. and people today have heard of Wire CNN, but I'm not sure if back when you and I met, it was as well known. They'd heard of the Associated Press, of Reuters, of Agence France Press. But Wire CNN was CNN's own version of a wire service. How did you start at CNN? 
Yeah. You know, this is really important too, because people live in this era of social media, in which people think a lot about branding themselves. So what happened with me was I, I was all over the air on NPR and this was basically through my twenties. And you know, there's a lot of wonderful things that come from that. It has the biggest audience of anything in broadcast news, more than anything on TV, anything in radio. But it started to get to the point in my late twenties or around age 30, where I felt like it was invading my identity. I was starting to think of myself as Josh Lips, NPR News. And I was like, you're never your job. You, I don't care if you're the president. You are not your job. You are a human being. You are a homo sapien on this little tiny marble in the universe. And I was like, I need to drop off the air for a year. And I knew people at CNN. And I wanted to get involved in the newsroom making editorial decisions. And someone suggested to me, Wire CNN, because the way it worked there was if we at Wire CNN, this group of people, if we wrote a Wire story inside CNN, as soon as we published it, all of CNN's outlets in the world would start reporting it. It would immediately go to CNN International, CNN Domestic, CNN Espanol, CNN Radio.com. And it was far more powerful than any individual story I could do. But also, I wanted to disappear from the public airwaves for at least a year. So I got this opportunity and I was like, I'll try it. So at first, both places let me split my time doing both. I'm sorry, how did you get that opportunity at CNN? I'm sorry. So I, someone told me who was in charge. All these people at CNN had heard me on NPR. And so I contacted some of them whom I had met through a contact. And I said, hey, this is the kind of thing I want to do. I want to get involved in the newsroom, drop off in the air for a year. Two of them suggested Wire CNN. They had me call the person who oversaw it. I was fortunate. He had heard me on NPR. He was like, you want to drop off the air and come do this for a while? Yeah, I mean, I've heard your stuff. It's great. Come on in and meet with me. I met with him. He immediately said, well, do you want us to hire you? Do you want to? Like, what? I said, well, I would want to do it as freelance to try it out. So I asked NPR for permission to go to half schedule with them. And I asked him for have two or three days a week. And everyone said yes. So again, you can create what you do. So I started doing NPR half the week and wire CNN half the week. And I loved CNN so good. And I became like allergic to hearing myself on the radio because I knew in my instincts, I had to disappear for a year. I had to stop letting that invade my identity. Like I am this person who is on NPR. So then I just stopped with NPR and I started doing only Wire CNN for a year and I loved it. And so again, it was without applying because I was able to make the connection and start off as a freelancer and prove myself. And then they worked out a deal where once I wanted to do it full time, they said, okay, we'll bring you on and give you benefits and stuff. It reminds me, Josh, of what some actors go through when they feel they're typecast Mm -hmm. in a particular role and they have to push and fight and whatever to get that, like, I'm not just a comedic actor. I can also be a dramatic performer. Give me that break. So this was your way of creating the break for yourself. And you're totally right about that. Because I remember when I started, there were some people at the desk who were like, oh, another broadcaster who thinks he can write. And then what they didn't understand is I had had to work on writing in order to do NPR. Like I said, I got the toughest editor. So I came in with the writing skills. So then like they would give me the least important stories at first. And then when they were like, oh, he did well on this. Okay, let's give him something hard. And then they liked that too. So I had probably a harder, I know, not probably. I had a harder time at first proving that I could do this job than someone who would have come from like a small newspaper somewhere because they had all this writing experience that people could read. Fantastic. So how did you cups and ice your way from wire CNN (laughs) to getting your on-air break? Because that is not the usual path. I don't know if our listeners may be majoring in broadcast journalism or journalism, but usually the path to getting on air, if you don't become a reporter in some no-name place, is becoming a producer. But it is not usual to go from wire CNN. Maybe it is now, but it wasn't when I knew you back then. That was not the usual path. Right. Usually it's either as a producer or as a local station reporter. So you're right. It was unheard of. And people told me it wouldn't happen. And inside CNN, all these people were like, we only want... I mean, like I got so much rejection. Once I did wires for a year, I started wanting to do some on-air stuff. And that was when the rejection started. 
They're like, no, you're too real a journalist. No, we only you're want... You're too like, real a journalist? Is that literally uh, what they said? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, and then there were these two people who told me, listen, there are capital T's and capital J's. Capital J's are journalists first. Capital T's are TV people first. They, they said, and there was another executive too. He said, they're looking for pretty boys from entertainment shows. You come along as a journalist. This isn't for you. I mean, but... But people had said that to me about NPR as well. Like, and the way I am, the rejection fueled me. But I will tell you, it got to me after a year. And I did. I went to a therapist and I was like feeling so down. And when I got it, because my, my wife was like, you have to talk to someone. And because she, she said, was what? like, I'm sick of listening to you, dude. I'm sick of, this. of you being sad or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Doctor. I'm no, just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I know you're right, though. I mean, and so when I went there, he said, What's wrong? And it took me like five minutes to get it out. I sat there and I said, I'm a failure. I am a failure. And he was like, What? Because, <laughs> you know, he had heard and seen my work. And he did. But then I said, like, This was the first time I had spent more than a year trying to make something happen. And looking back in the scope of things, what's a year? But at the time, it felt like a lot. So I, you know, I had just kept being told, no, 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 this isn't what we're looking for. Yeah, we're, they want like the pretty boys. They want like people who are going to take journalism less seriously. They want people who will do like, which by the way- I'm sorry, Andy Rooney. Too. I'm sorry, Andy Rooney. And I know oh, our man. listeners- I mean, don't know your Andy. Your dad, okay. He's okay, but my no, but I was gonna say my dad actually for years, years and years, probably to this day, and he's about to turn 83, had a chip on his shoulder because he wasn't the you know drop dead gorgeous uh, news person, right. anchor, whatever. And first of all, Josh, I mean, you're a good looking guy. I don't know what they're talking about <laughs> with this like pretty boy. And it reminds me, Josh, of when I after I came back from China, after I graduated from college and decided I wanted to be a journalist and I'd worked at a member station of NPR for six months, hustled my way to a job working for the all news radio station here in D.C. And I, too, wanted to break into broadcast. And I went to see somebody who was an executive at public television. And he said to me, well, I guess you're, how do you, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. He said the most backhanded way of telling me I wasn't fucking ugly. Right. That was really what he said. Mm -hmm. And it so hurt mm -hmm. to have somebody judge me purely on my looks that I, I can't say it deterred me. I think it also fueled me. Me too. Well, that's, that's, that's something that makes you and me and uh, the listeners who have the potential to be this way successful. Look, by the way, thank you. But I mean, every, every actor has been told this too. I mean, like Tom Cruise was told he, couldn't, he wasn't good looking enough to be on TV. I mean, so the idea of being told this is really more about the person saying it. And one thing I learned early on, and this is important for your listeners, is that it's, you have to understand and internalize this. No other human being will ever know what you're capable of. No one. You cannot count on other people to believe in you or your career trajectory. You have to know your instinct. You know what you're capable of. I had been told that my voice wouldn't work for NPR, that I was all over NPR. So even when they were saying this to me, I knew the people saying this to me had been told that and internalized it themselves. So it was more practical to me. I mean, I wasn't like, you know, so hurt in that sense. I was more like, I know I need to do this and they're not letting me. And that was when I thought, okay, you know what? I've tried for a year. I'm going to go do magic proposals. And I got the Katrina idea. And instead of bringing it to CNN, where they would have stolen it and had someone else do it on the air, I went and, and did it for NPR. And at the time, because I had switched to freelance for NPR, after I got this whole series, in order to be eligible for awards, they had this policy where they would not apply freelancers for awards. So I had to come up with the money myself, and it was expensive at the time, to submit my own reporting for those Murrow Awards. But I was like, if I win, maybe it'll help me. So I came up with the money. I applied. I ended up being the only person who won any awards for NPR that year. So it's a good thing I did this for them. They sent me all these gifts. They refunded me for the applications. And, and that's when the whole thing happened at CNN with the boss saying, wait, why did he just win Rose for NPR when he could have won it for us? And then that's when we get to how I then made the jump because no one made that jump from wires to on air. And what happened was I heard that I had, I had a, a very high level contact at CNN 
who spoke about it in the morning meeting for the whole company. And that's when the head of the company said, why didn't he win it for us? And right after that, I messaged him and I said, you know why? Because you haven't put me on air. Please meet me. I got a five minute meeting with him that weekend. And then that meeting, which if you want me, I can tell you what happened. But that meeting changed everything. That meeting was the reason I got it. Five minutes, literally. So give us the high level takeaways from that meeting, because this is another cups and ice story. Lessons from being Jewish. When Pharaoh says he's going to let your people go, don't wait and let the bread rise. Just <laughs> leave, okay? You leave not to forever, doesn't matter. Leave. When I went into that meeting, I said, look, this is the thing. If I were on the air with you, I want to win these awards for you. I'm not asking to become a traditional correspondent. I watch the, uh, what we're doing. I want to create a position in which I jump on the air and fact check anything and everything all the time. Live guests were just on, here are the facts. Guests yesterday were on, here are the facts. The president spoke, someone from any party spoke. Let me just jump on and do these fact check things. And he said, okay, try it on the weekend. That was my Pharaoh moment. I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible before he could change his mind. So I said, thank you so much. Got to run. He said, oh, that's good because my car is outside. So it was great. I left. But let's think about what he said. He said, try it on the weekend. He didn't say do one story ever. He said, try it on the weekend. So I thought, okay, how can I maximize this? Well, the weekend is 48 hours long. We are programming from 5 a.m. Saturday until 11 p.m. Sunday. I can do it the whole weekend. But wait, we have international. On Fridays, it's already a weekend somewhere in the world. On Mondays, it's still weekend somewhere in the world. I'm going to do Friday through Monday and do as many stories as I can. I did more live shots on the weekend than any person did during the week. And when they saw that work and they, I didn't suck at it, and I said, I want to learn to do better and better and better, I turned that into my next career. So everyone get out those plastic red party cups <laughs> and put it on your head. Put that fucking plastic red hat on your head and maximize any opportunity you get. Oh, my God. So you became the fact checker in chief who was working around the fucking clock, Josh. Yeah. And then once they saw that it worked, then they expanded me to the whole week. And then I, I worked it out so I didn't have to keep doing the wire stuff as well. So I was able to keep doing that and then turn it into something. And, and you know, we had this comedy show for a while. They featured me on that. Like I, I was able to turn it into something. And then it was very, as you know, very unstable place to work, TV news. But uh, during that time, I was making connections and building what is considered a brand for myself. And learning, learning. Were you doing things. that intentionally? Were you saying, I want to be the Josh Lebs fact checker in chief brand? At that time, I was because I started to see that when it came to fact checking, no one on air was doing it with the intensity that I was. But this is also, you know, just a broader thing about our culture. Like, I don't like live guests going on TV and lying all the time. I, I hate it with an active dispassion. So, yes, I wanted to. I wanted everyone in the network and in America to understand that the more you listen to me, the more facts you'll get, the more truth you'll get. Now, unfortunately, large numbers of Americans don't care about facts. But <laughs> for those who do, yes, I wanted to make sure that they knew that they could trust and listen to me. Thanks for tuning in to this K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. If you want to listen to our entire caffeinated career conversation, please check out the show notes for this episode. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.